Good morning and good evening. I'm April from USC. Welcome audience in Zoom and live streaming platforms of USC Graduate Education. This is the 111th USC event to learn cutting edge knowledge and ideas. And again, featuring and focusing on AI and new technology. In today's event, we are going to explore the impact of AI on TESO education, navigating opportunities and confronting challenges. We are so honored to have Dr. Rob Fieback. He is the Professor of Clinical Education and Chair of MAT TESO program from USC Rossier School of Education. He will share with us his insights on the prospects and challenges of AI and the practice of TESO education. Welcome, Dr. Fieback. Great. Thank you, April. Thank you. And kindly remind for Zoom audience, please mute yourself, and this webinar will be recorded and might be used as video material in future. We will have Q&A part open to audience in last 15 minutes. And now let's get started. Follow with us to explore AI in language teaching. And I will pass it over to Dr. Fieback. Great. Uh, thanks again, April, and uh, welcome to everyone in the room and to all of you streaming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you um, here. I'm signing in from Los Angeles on the West Coast, so it's 8 p.m. my time, roughly. Um, and I, I know you all, many of you are starting a new day there, so um, uh, wish you a good day. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you tonight. Uh, this is a topic that has become uh, really exciting and interesting to me. Um, it's not necessarily my area of research going back over a long period of time, but it has become over the last few years, and especially in the last couple of years, um, a real area of strong interest for me, as well as some of my colleagues um, in the MATT cell program at uh, Rossier. So I will be sharing with you out of my own um, activity and reading and research, and I'm looking forward to that. There's a little bit of an irony, though, um, as a person, in terms of my personality, I'm actually a little bit of a um, someone who doesn't really like technology that much. So this is a little known fact. But uh, for example, for many, many years, while people were getting cell phones, I refused to own a cell phone. This was back, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. And I was one of the very late uh, adopters of just a basic cell phone. And it was just more of a way of me being kind of countercultural countercultural, and trying to protect my own time. And I really appreciate um, solitude. So it's kind of interesting to me that now I find myself in a world where technology is becoming so much more prevalent, um, but I'm also starting to become much more adept at using it. And I'm start beginning to start to appreciate the power that it potentially has to enhance learning, which is, of course, what I care about most, um, learning and learning outcomes, especially among students that maybe don't have access as much to the kind of education that I think everyone should enjoy. So uh, with that little introduction, I'll call up my slides and I will begin uh, talking through some things that I prepared for tonight and I look forward to questions and comments that you might have. So let me pull up my slide deck here. And then let me go to full screen mode. Hopefully you all can see that just fine. Um, so tonight we're really talking about exploring uh, the role of AI and TESOL. Um, this is a, a, a field that's growing quickly. There's a lot happening. Uh, I can't actually, it, it's hard to believe the number of tools and research articles that are uh, flying off the pages and the shelves and out of schools at this time uh, about this topic. So this is a topic that many, many people are interested in and writing about. So it's fun to talk about it and uh, explore it a little bit with you. So my agenda tonight is just want to talk a little bit about what we're talking about when, when I'm talking about AI tonight, um, look a little bit at kind of where this is all going, and then think about pros and cons uh, briefly. And then I do want to move into just some brief examples of, of some things that you can do practically with AI tools. Uh, and then end with some general guidance, because I hope that um, my talk tonight will inspire 
you to go out and try uh, whatever is available to you a little bit more. And I recognize that many of you listening might be experts already in, in using AI tools. Others of you maybe haven't dipped your toe in even one bit yet. So wherever you are on that spectrum, um, I hope that you know tonight has something to offer uh, for, for you. And then of course, we'll end with uh, any discussion or questions that you might have. Uh, so what, what do I mean by AI? So artificial intelligence, uh, but when we talk about AI and when I'm thinking about AI tonight, I'm really talking about this latest wave that we've seen over the last couple of years in what we call generative AI. Um, and so this is a, a subset of machine learning and deep learning, and there's lots of overlapping, overlapping boundaries within AI, broadly speaking. But generative AI is unique in that it is designed to develop or create or generate new things. It's ostensibly creative to create new content, things that are novel and useful. Um, now there's, uh, again, some debate about even the use of the word creativity or creative with generative AI. But the basic idea here is we're talking about um, machine learning that is, is uh, uh, scanning and scraping vast data sets to learn exemplars and patterns. Um, and, and from that, respond to prompts by generating new patterns, um, original patterns, and, uh, and provide useful data, useful information for the user. So generative AI is primarily what we're talking about tonight. Um, and generative AI is being used across language sets. Uh, it's being used in videos. Um, it's uh, being used to create music, images, um, and it's especially being used a lot in coding. Uh, I myself am not a software coder, um, but even just this last week preparing for tonight's talk, I found a really interesting little uh, way that even novices in coding can play around with using generative AI to develop some basic code and create a little video game. So I, I'm going to be looking at that more, um, you know, in the coming days. So there's a, a lot of interesting ways that that this is being applied. One of the reasons why there's such an explosion of interest right now is because unlike a lot of the other forms of artificial intelligence, whether it's predictive or natural language processing, expert systems, you name it, the, the list is very long. Generative AI is being used in some applications that are very accessible. Uh, they're out there in the real world for people to use and try. Some of them, many of them still have free versions that people can try out. And so uh, we're seeing a, a sort of this explosion of interest, an explosion of trial and application around this notion of generative AI. So, so really, when we're talking about AI and TESOL tonight, we're primarily thinking about this notion of generative AI, but it does touch on and overlap with some of the areas, other areas as well. Um, but, but I just want to make sure we're clear sort of on this notion of generative AI and how that plays into um, some of the more recent tools and applications that are, are so popular right now in, in some of the press. Um, I wanted to also, by way of definition and kind of setting the context, um, this is just an image uh, uh, from a group called Ragtime. And I just thought this was useful because, you know, when we, again, when we're talking about AI and what do we mean? Um, yes, there is this thing called generative AI, one category within AI that I talked about. But if you think about AI, broadly speaking, Here's two dozen different sectors or areas of our daily lives that are deeply impacted already by AI. So this is just meant to give you a, a, a landscape and say that the use of AI is, is everywhere. We're already using it a lot, not necessarily generative AI, but we're using all types of, gener uh, of AI across a, a, a range of activities that we carry out from day to day already. Uh, whether that's when we're driving down the road, uh, when we're scanning a check to deposit into our bank, uh, whether we're looking at a social media platform and being told what would be of interest to us. Again, the list is really long. And, and I think this image um, does a nice job of portraying all these different ways that AI plays out into our daily lives. Uh, by the way, if possible, I, I provided the slides and, and these will be shared later. Um, so you, you're, you're welcome to look at these slides more carefully uh, uh, at your leisure later on. Um, so that's the big picture. But what do we talk? When do we talk about that one little corner of education, right? One of the 
on that last slide, 24 areas. Education is just one of those. Well, if you just look within education, you, I, I mean, here's a, here's a, a, a 30 AI tools, right? They're proliferating so fast and uh, uh, coming off the shelves, so to speak, so fast that I certainly can't keep up. I've just dipped my toe in and tried a few tools, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's so many things out there that it's really hard to keep up. This means we're already seeing a, a real um, pervasive use of AI within education sector itself, both in K-12 and higher ed. A lot of the focus is on um, repetitive tasks, more of the simple tasks, which is uh, uh, typical and, and appropriate for the stage that we're at. But we're also starting to see more complexity in the kind of tasks that AI can, um, can accomplish. And generative AI sort of plays into that, starting to think less about um, routine tasks and more about how could I generate new content? How could I uh, have someone assess my curriculum? Could I have somebody assess my students' work? And, and we're seeing that that's starting to take place through some of the new tools um, that are, that are uh, emerging. Uh, there are strong opinions around the use of AI right now. There's strong opinions advocating for this, and there's strong uh, uh, people that are opponents of, of AI. Many opponents are saying it's too, too fast. We need to slow this down. There's too many ethical concerns. We just don't know yet how this is going to play out. And then you have advocates that are saying, no, those critiques, those concerns are overblown. We need to dive in and try this more. So I would, I would put myself somewhere in somewhere in the middle, a little bit of a agnostic at the moment in terms of where this is all going to go. But I'm definitely trying to be an experimenter and an innovator within this world and also really keep on my kind of critical hat um, and really think carefully and critically about how these tools um, might be used. The bottom line here, whether you're on whatever side of that continuum that you are, or, or if you're in the middle somewhere, um, one of the, the reports that I like to look at is um, the, the Horizon Report put out by Educause. Every year, Horizon Report puts out a, um, a, it's essentially a five to 10, 15 year kind of future cast about what's happening with technology and education. The 2023 Educause Horizon Report consensus is uh, AI in education is probably going to go mainstream. That means it's going to continue to be used. Um, it's going to be continue to be more pervasive, used in a greater variety of ways. And so I think this is important to recognize and to also think about as we engage tonight, uh, that wherever you are in your use or uh, comfort level or experience level with this, um, this is something that we are going to see probably happening more and more across the education sector. So I think it's important to, to really, again, go in open-eyed, cautiously, but certainly with an innovator mindset um, and our critical uh, thinking cap as well. Okay, but we're talking about TESOL. Okay, so we have all those sectors at large. Then we thought about education, broadly speaking, and now we're thinking about language education, and specifically English language education. Um, so what is happening within language education? Well, it's, it's similar to education, I think, in many other sectors in the sense that, number one, we're not quite sure yet exactly how it's going to impact our field. Uh, it is developing fast, and it's very exciting to watch. Um, we're primarily seeing tools in the areas of uh, uh, enhancing uh, activities like tutoring, um, writing tutoring, writing assistance, writing feedback, assessment. Uh, one of the exciting areas that I've been starting to look at a little bit more is the notion of conversation bots. There are many out there. There are some plugins that you can use across a range of tools now to start conversing and turning some of the text based um, AI, generative AI tools into verbal AI uh, tools. So that is very exciting. Some of them are still a little bit clunky or a little bit cumbersome, but they're going to, they're going to continue to improve and they're going to continue to improve very fast. Um, now, all of that said, the big question, of course, is, hey, I'm, a, I'm an aspiring language educator or I'm a, I'm a language teacher in the field. Uh, maybe I've been one for a long time or I'm thinking about getting into this. Is there going to be a role for humans or are robots going to take over the language education space? Well, um, 
I can confidently say, and this is based on my own professional opinion and a lot of the reading that I've been done, um, is that there's still going to be a really important role for humans in all of this. So this is not going to be about uh, machines replacing humans. This is more going to be about um, humans learning to curate, work with, um, and manage machine learning, generative AI, and all the other types of tools that are going to emerge um, to enhance their practice and hopefully increase learning outcomes for their students. So uh, I think I think that's the good news. Is it going to impact some educational context? Is it going to impact some educators? Yes, it probably will. Um, but, but when we think about it broadly, this is really going to be more of a, uh, I think uh, we're looking at kind of a synergy and thinking about how humans can use AI well. So because of that, it's important for us, I think, as educators and as language educators to get in front of this, uh, get out in front of the wave, so to speak, um, to really uh, not be reluctant, not be afraid, not hold back, but start to explore, start to experiment and understand um, how to be more conversant with this, uh, this whole area of technology, um, what works, what doesn't, and, um, and, and be seen as people who can turn this into a skill set and an area of expertise that we can add on to all the other great things that, that we do as educators. So um, the, I'll, in some of the other things that we'll cover here tonight, we'll, we'll say more about all of this, but that's a broad, I think, um, stroke in terms of what we might be expecting, broadly speaking, uh, about how this is going to impact our field. Now, are there benefits? Are there things that we can look forward to? Um, yeah. Uh, the first bullet is my favorite. Um, I'm always trying to figure out how I can work smarter, not harder, how I can make my work more efficient, how I can do things to make um, my tasks easier and simpler. And I'm happy to say on a, on a, on a firsthand level that I've really been trying to explore this first bullet. How can I use AI tools and AI-assisted tools um, in my planning, uh, in my grading, in my feedback. I've had some good experiences and I've had some negative feed, uh, experiences. I, I spent um, quite a while creating an elaborate rubric to help me do a first pass at some uh, student work that my graduate students had done. I was thinking, I'll give it a real simple rubric, let it do a first pass at these 25 papers that I have to grade, give me some basic high-level feedback, and then I'll come in as the um, faculty expert and assess that and give it a second pass and give the final grade. Well, after all of that rubric building, I plugged it into chat GPT. Um, I passed a couple papers through it and it just gave me garbage, I have to say. Um, so that was, a, again, an example that didn't work, but I chalked it up as a learning um, and I moved on. And there have been a lot of examples that have worked well. Um, and part of that was how I built the rubric uh, to plug into ChatGPT in that case. Um, one other thing I'll say, I know that I'm going to be talking about tools and some of the tools maybe that were on that previous slide are things that I have access to that are prevalent here um, in the U.S. Um, I don't know the landscape that well in terms of what you have access to in China. In fact, uh, I want to conduct a survey and I hope many of you will participate uh, when I send that out later. Um, to, 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 so we can learn a little bit more about what your experience is and what's happening um, throughout China. Uh, I know that companies like Baidu and Alibaba are working on uh, AI tools, um, and, and some have been released, some are in product development, some are promised to be released. So, But I don't know specifically as much about those. But I do want to say that the things that I'm talking about tonight, I think, carry over. Uh, because uh, a lot of the tools that are going to be developed are going to be very similar to, you know, what's developed in one country is going to be similar to that developed in another country. Uh, later on, I will be talking a little bit more about ChatGPT. I think ChatGPT right now, developed by OpenAI, is, is I think it's accessible in about 11 or 12 countries around the world. Um, I expect that will grow, but uh, that is one that I've been experimenting, experimenting with a lot recently. But again, just because I'm using examples from that tonight um, uh, it doesn't mean it's irrelevant. I think you're going to be seeing similar types of tools, if you haven't already, um, wherever that you're based. Uh, other potential benefits. So one of the greatest things 
that um, I think we have the potential to do with technology and specifically with AI and with generative AI is to increase this push towards personalized learning and individualized learning. Uh, the famous study called the Two Sigma study by um, Bloom, the famous Bloom from Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, he did a study that not too many people know about um, called the Two Sigma study, where he compared learning uh, across three different conditions, one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, and mastery focus, all the way up to um, group work in a traditional classroom and more of a performance fo focus. And, and that famous study showed that those that had a mastery orientation with one-on-one -on -one support in kind of a tutoring environment um, actually had two um, standard deviations, two sigmas uh, of greater performance in, in their um, uh, learning outcomes. That's 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 dramatic, and 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 I think that study should get more attention. But anyway, you can Google it, Bloom's two sigma study. Well, I th I think that in the best case scenario, technology and tools and the kind of things we're talking about tonight are moving us even more towards that, where students even if they're in a classroom of 50 and there's one teacher and a, a large group of students through some of these tools they can start to experience more personalization of learning individualization of learning greater differentiation we call it based on different skills and needs uh, the students bring so that that to me is a, 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 a exciting benefit that we have potentially um a way to uh, increase through these tools um enhanced learning broadly speaking um even through more engagement, uh, getting more feedback. Uh, uh, we as teachers, as you know, can only, we only have so much time. We can only give so much feedback and some of these tools can accelerate and uh, expand uh, that aspect. Um, another thing I love about where all of this is taking us is less emphasis on thoughts and feelings and perceptions about who is learning and what is being learned uh, and more toward actual data-driven decisions. Um, so the more that we can all collectively move towards data-driven assessment, looking at the data, what are our students using, how is it working, all of that is becoming, I think, um, a byproduct of the push toward use of technology as well as AI. Um, another one, the last bullet, very exciting for me. I'm a big proponent of self-directed learning, and uh, through all the tools that we're talking about and seeing emerge, um, this is another way that teachers can empower and equip students to become self-directed learners for themselves. What is the most amazing thing that a teacher can do? Create somebody who's a voracious learner. Create someone who's curious and has the skills and appetite uh, and wherewithal to go out and ask questions and learn things for themselves. And I think a lot of the tools that we're seeing um, can and have an opportunity to enhance that. Um, here's a, a I, I grab this image. Sometimes I like to talk about the difference between traditional education and active learning, or formalistic learning and more active learning. Um, uh, this uh, uh, image from online schools in India uses the term traditional learning and modern education, but I just grab this because I think it does a nice job of sort of comparing side by side. Um, a really important distinction, and that is on the left, uh, under traditional models of learning, essentially what we're talking about there is the more teacher-centric, uh, teacher-centered, um, didactic, delivery mode of learning where teacher is active, students are passive, teacher has the knowledge, students passively receive the knowledge. Um, this is a very common approach still to this day around the world in, in all however many 150 plus countries there are right now. Um, this, is, this is something that still exists and it's still out there. Uh, but what we know is all the evidence is pointing to there are greater learning outcomes if we move more towards an active learning posture. Uh, and that will, is what we see in the right-hand column. And this is where we have um, much more an emphasis on students being active participants, um, agents in their own learning, um, where it's much more of a two-way interaction. Uh, students ask questions freely. Um, they inquire, they're curious. Um, and it's all about mastery, less about performance. It's about how can I master this skill or this area of knowledge 
for the sake of learning, for the sake of experience mastery, as opposed to getting a certain score to perform uh, X uh, amount on a, on a given assessment. Again, we know that tests, standardized tests, high stakes tests are important all around the world. It's, a, it's an important reality that we have to contend with, but nevertheless, we know that there are greater learning outcomes with some of the things that you see in the right-hand column under modern, uh, modern education. Uh, and so what I would, my, my takeaway here is that uh, to the extent that the technology, technology enhanced learning that we're experiencing more and more, including through the role of um, uh, generative AI and other AI uh, technologies, um, in the ideal scenario, it's it allowing us to move even more into the right-hand column in whatever teaching or learning context we're in. Um, and that to me, that's that's exciting. And that's a huge benefit that we need to think about uh, carefully. Are there challenges? Uh, are there risks? Yes. And uh, I think this is really important to understand. If we go into this naively, if we go into this without asking important, difficult questions, if we go into this without a critical mindset, we're going to be really, I think, it, it, essentially we're being gullible and we're going to believe a lot of things that aren't true. This is, I've seen this firsthand with my experimentation over the last few months with some of these tools. Um, I, I gave the example earlier about building a rubric and then putting it into the machine and getting out some garbage that I really couldn't use. Um, it's through experiences like that where I'm starting to realize, wow, there are serious limits to, to many of these tools and we need to be you know, uh, 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 careful and observant and understand exactly what's going on. If we put too much trust, if we put too much um, faith in some of these tools, if we just believe what the companies and the marketers say, or what somebody promoting them through TikTok or whatever channel you watch about a particular tool, tool perhaps they're getting advertising uh, dollars for promoting it. If we just rely on that, um, I think we're, we're really going into this in the wrong way. So we have to re be really careful and critical about some of these challenges. Um, equity, uh, are these tools accessible to everyone? Well, sometimes there's a free version, but sometimes there's a paid version that's really a lot better. Uh, and, and who can afford that? Uh, data privacy, we saw in Italy, uh, an entire country turn off its access to chat GPT because there was some fear around data being shared. Some prompts that someone had put in uh, and the output turned up in another person's feed. And so uh, an entire company, a country said, look, we're not going to do that until we figure this out. Data privacy is a concern. Um, unreliable output. I mentioned that already. Bias in AI algorithms. Uh, we've seen a lot of important writing about this. We've seen various generative AI or other AI tools being biased based on a person's skin color. color. Sometimes the uh, uh, fairer or lighter skinned uh, people that might be using a generative AI and related to photographs um, gets a different result than someone with darker skin. Um, and so that is, uh, uh, in a sense, racial bias, color bias in an AI generative tool. In, in the language field, we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff being written right now about language bias. Uh, people with a dialect, people with a um, uh, uh, who might speak with a certain um, uh, accent, and are they being uh, perceived? Are they being processed in this way, way by some of these algorithms as others? And the data is showing that it's not always the case. Um, and so uh, we, we're even seeing this in terms of international students, um, speaker people for whom English is a second, third, fourth language. Are being treated differently by some of these algorithms than people who are uh, speaking English as a first language. So bias is something that we have to think about and we have to contend with. Um, some of the other things, if we if we if we use technology too much, if we start relying on uh, giving um, uh, you know using it for some of these routine tasks, perhaps there are important skills that we're going to lose or that our students are going to lose if if we don't uh, figure out a way to use those in some ways. Um, so, uh, oh, cheating, the last bullet. How can we not talk about cheating? This is a huge one, right? Everyone's afraid, is this gonna be used for cheating? Well, is it? Yes. <laughs> are, are people using it? Of course, are students using it uh, where they have access to these tools? Yes, they are. Are people trying to cheat? Yes, they are. The challenge is, what we're finding is that 
can you ban it completely? Well, the evidence is piling up that that's very difficult to do. Uh, it's hard for a school district to do it. It's hard for a school to do it. It's much less harder for an entire country to do it. There are workarounds. There are ways to get through. Um, so then some people say, well, look, maybe we can police it. Maybe we can monitor it. Um, and what we're finding there is that that's very difficult to do. The tools haven't yet caught up with the um, generative AI. And so what we're what we're starting to see is more awareness and understanding around how it might be used and how we as faculty, as teachers, can use these tools in ways that make cheating a non-issue. Uh, just as an example, last spring, my faculty and our TESOL program, when ChatGPT and other tools like it were, again, really in, in the news and very hot, and a lot of institutions around the world were saying, what are we going to do? Uh, we just simply said, well, let's take every assessment, everything that we ask our students to do in our courses and see if a tool like ChatGPT can do it uh, and see what the result is. And uh, what we found is that some of those uh, things that we asked it to do based on the assessments that we have in our courses, it was a little bit worrisome and we had to change it because we realized, wow, there could be some really interesting stuff generated through generative AI that could look like a, a feasible response to this. Other things we were happy to find out, we had made them personalized and unique enough and distinctive enough around the content in our course that it's something that that uh, uh, something like uh, a generative AI tool just couldn't couldn't uh, match. So, but that's the kind of thinking we we didn't say we're going to police it or ban it. We said let's figure out how to work with it. And and then the other thing that we're doing in our program is uh, we're starting to make uh, the use of AI, an open conversation with our students who are training to be teachers. Let's talk about it. How are you using it? Hey, here's an assignment. Here's an idea for how you could use AI-assisted tools, uh, AI assistance to complete this assignment in a specific way at a specific point. So those are, I think, ways that we're, we're thinking about um, using it. And I, I think this gets to the heart of it. Uh, the Minerva Project, I don't know if you've heard of this, a very innovative um, uh, uh, university model here in the US with activity all around the world, <coughs> they put out a report. And I think this really sums it up well. Um, we can say that the future is going to be AI integrated. We, it already is. The present is AI integrated. Go back to that chart with 24 sectors right around the circle. We're using it all the time. That's going to happen more and more in education as well. So if we say as an educator, as a teacher in a classroom, wherever you are, I'm going to try to figure out how to incorporate this. I'm going to figure out how to use this. What does this mean for my practice? <coughs> Excuse me. What does this mean for my curriculum? And rather than trying to prevent it or ignore it, I'm going to try to integrate it. And, and if to the extent that we will do that, uh, we will better prepare ourselves and better prepare our students uh, for a world where AI is going to be more and more um, prevalent. So I think this is a good um, uh, ca captures my sentiment, certainly, and I think a, a growing consensus of uh, thinkers around the world on this topic. Um, I'm just going to pause for one second and uh, get a step away for a glass of water. Give me one minute. All right, I'm back. Thank you for that. Thanks for your patience. So with that, I want to turn now to just some examples. Uh, first, kind of broadly speaking, and then I'll show you a few more specific examples that I've done recently. Um, but I want to move a little bit to kind of what are we talking about? Um, what does this look like and how can we use it? So just a, these are just a couple of tools. Again, I'm, I'm referring to the tools that I have access to where I'm based. Uh, you may recognize some of these. You may not. There may be uh, uh, corollaries to these that are accessible to you. Um, but just a couple first, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, again, increasing the amount of feedback that we can give our students, I think, is powerful. One tool, Speakable, allows you to do that. So, again, you're thinking about, uh, I encourage everyone to start with the task, not with the tool. 
So I'm really focused on the left side of this image, right? This slide. What is the task that I want to do? I want to increase the feedback. And in this case, Speakable is just one of many tools that, that I could use to do that. Personalized language learning, okay? Uh, I have my phone here. Uh, it doesn't show up. There it is. Um, I've got Duolingo on there. I'm trying to learn some Chinese. Um, I found I, I've wanted to uh, learn Chinese. Um, at this point, I, I don't want to pay a tutor. I don't want to go to class yet. I just want some introductory personalized language learning. Duolingo has been helpful with that. Um, and it's uh, smart learning. It's assisted. It's, it's based on learning analytics. Uh, it's also based on generative AI based on some of the uh, data sets that it uses to scrape to provide content. Um, and it provides learning that's um, leveled and uh, uh, geared towards me based on my previous performance. So I've enjoyed using Duolingo. Again, one example fitting the task um, that, that I set out to accomplish. Uh, language Tutor. This is an area I'm very excited about. Um, I, I Going back more than a decade, I've seen experimentation around virtual tutors and real life conversation. And we're starting to get to a point now where I think this is going to be a, a it's already a reality and it's going to become more and more of a reality uh, very quickly. So AI powered language tutors, uh, TalkPal is just one of these. And um, there are many others like it. Writing assistance and feedback, writing, uh, right? One of the four skills, <clears throat> something that we all have to do, our students have to do. How can I, as a teacher, or how can I, as a student, how can I provide more feedback to my students? If I'm a student, how can I get more feedback on my writing? Um, and and uh, applications like Grammarly, again, there's lots of them like that, um, are, are geared to provide that kind of assistance, where it, whether it's error correction, giving suggestions, identifying um, conventions, such as APA or other writing uh, norms that are out there, and, and helping you um, improve your writing in those ways. And then finally, generating language content, uh, moving toward uh, more along the lines of the generative AI that, that, that uh, I emphasized earlier, we get to things like chat GPT. Um, so I, I just kind of want to focus in the next few slides on some specific things I've done with chat GPT. I think chat GPT or other tools like it or, or chat or open AI or chat GPT based tools that are going to be appearing more and more. I think that's a really um, excellent place to focus in terms of thinking about the power of generative AI. So I just want to share a few examples. Uh, this is me just playing around. Um, I'm a faculty member in the, in the field of TESOL. So most of the actual stuff I've done with ChatGPT has been around my courses and my students and things that I do. For our purposes tonight, I pretended like I was a language teacher. I put my, my language teacher hat back on, replayed um, you know, my experiences when I was back teaching college or high school in the field of English language um, teaching and, and created some prompts and got some responses from ChatGPT. And I just wanted to show you a few of these. Okay, I've got about, I think, five here. Um, so one, when we talk about generative AI and we talk about a tool like ChatGPT, or others similar to it, which is getting a lot of hype these days, what can you do with it? Well, um, one thing is you can generate a class activity. Uh, so in this, I simply logged into ChatGPT. I'm paying for the $20 a month paid version as opposed to the free version. Um, and I got in there so I could use the more powerful version of ChatGPT. Uh, I can either opt to have it scrape the internet, or I can turn off scrape the internet and just have it based on data that it collects uh, prior to 2021. Those are all little options that you'll learn to play with. But here's the fundamental thing. I said, look, I'm a teacher. Uh, I need a role-playing activity. Um, uh, I've, I want it, maybe my unit right now is about historical characters. So I want, I want a role-playing activity that I can give my students in groups, give me five famous American characters, uh, it's got to help my intermediate level learners, and I particularly want them to focus on reporting events. Well, what did it give me? And this is where it kind of starts to blow your mind. Uh, here's the activity that it created, okay? Uh, tells me that it's created this role-playing activity that meets the demands that I plugged in. It's called the American Time Travelers. It gives me an objective, tells me what materials I need. 
Um, and then it gives me instructions for preparing, for introducing it, for the actual role play activity. Uh, and then what I could ask my students to do in terms of reporting and reflection. And then it even gives me an extension activity. Okay, this is, this is great. Now I didn't critique it. I didn't study this carefully. This was just the first draft. Uh, but if I was doing this seriously and I was gonna teach this in the next week, obviously I'd have, I'd have to critique this very carefully. But in my experience, these are some really great ways to generate initial ideas. And back to that first bullet on benefits, ways to, uh, to, to really uh, expedite and make my job as a teacher more um, efficient. Um, the other cool thing here is, uh, this one says you need event card, you need character profiles and you need event cards. Well, guess what? If I was going to do this, uh, I would actually continue the conversation with chat BTT and I would have it help me generate some character profiles around these characters. Um, uh, who, yeah, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and Thomas Edison. It could help me do that. Um, later on, the activity calls for event cards. I could use ChatGP to do that. Okay, so this is powerful. And, and even those negative experiences notwithstanding that I talked about earlier, I'm finding that there are uh, a lot of ways and productive ways to use it. This is just one quick example. Uh, another one, I said, look, I need not just an activity, but I need a lesson plan for the whole day or whatever. Uh, I'm a language teacher. My students in this case are A2 on the Common European Framework. Um, here, I want them to uh, make appointments and I, I want them to clarify details using WH questions, who, what, why, when, where, how, et cetera. Uh, so what did ChatBT give me in this case? Again, this is the first response. So you know, you, you, could, you could refine this. Uh, again, here's the objective for the lesson, the materials I'm gonna need, uh, a basic structure, warm up, presentation, practice, production, uh, with a wrap up. This is this is exciting. Uh, I, I was a teacher for quite a few years. I know how busy it can be. I know what Sundays were like, preparing for the week and scrambling to get everything together. These kinds of helpers are really tremendous. And does this make me a weaker teacher, or does this make me a better teacher? And I would argue that this can make me a better teacher if it helps me get by some of the mundane stuff and I can start focusing more on the standards and alignment of my teaching, what I want to get out of the outcomes uh, and, and how I can continue to refine this more. Um, I'm the navigator, I'm in charge. I would try to refine these to make them what I need them to be. But in this case, ChatGPT is providing me with the experience of like a really fast teacher assistant. Uh, someone that can help me think about my instruction. Um, now, uh, what if, uh, here's another one, okay? So I've got a group of students. Let's say I've got 50 students. Um, and maybe uh, in a given week, I'm doing reading activities. And I don't want to just have them go out and find something to read. But I'd like to create some personalized content. Let's say I have a student in my group. She's 13, year old, 13 years old. She's, her name's Lily. What if I wanted to create personalized stories that they could then play around with, read, rewrite, analyze, whatever they're gonna do with language? Well, this took me like three seconds, all right? I asked ChatGPT to write a 125 story about a person named Lily. Uh, maybe I know because I have this student in my class that she wants to be a you know, ocean rescue person someday. Um, and so I, in, in literally seconds, I can create a little <clears throat> story or have ChatGPT write a little story. Uh, that I could then, in group work, hand to Lily. This is personalized, high-interest content. Imagine students receiving something like this. Is this something you could do every day? No. Is this something you're gonna, always going to do for all your students? No. Uh, but this is pretty cool. You could also have your students equipped to do this kind of thing for themselves or for their peers. Um, so this is amazing. Now, if you read this story, it actually is quite touching. Um, you know, most of the generic, most of the content that ChatGPT puts out is actually quite generic. It's kind of like the neutral, the mean of everything out there. Um, but sometimes it's actually quite good. And so I thought this was kind of a fun example uh, to include. And then finally, um, we know that differentiation or leveled content, content that's appropriate for our students level is important. So here I found a 50 word story by Francesco Lovato. Um, it, it's up at the top there. No one dared comment on the color of her hair, et cetera. 
And I thought, wow, that would be, I'd love for my class to read that. But I know some of my class are high level, some are middle, some are low. So I, in this case, I asked ChatGPT to write, rewrite the story uh, in two ways, one for more of a beginning English learner and one for an intermediate. And you'll see it did a pretty, a pretty nice job of generating stories at, at a couple different levels that I could then incorporate into an activity. Everyone does the same activity. In this case, um, I'm differentiating based on content. I'm giving them different levels of content. And uh, it, you could imagine that this could go uh, quite well. And each student uh, would have a story that's leveled appropriate for them. Uh, finally, um, what about our more, let's say we have advanced learners, they're preparing for the TOEFL, uh, and we, we want to help them. Or I'm preparing for the TOEFL, and I need some help. Um, I want more feedback. I want more practice time. Um, well, in this case, I pretended like I'm an English learner. I'm working on the TOEFL. I want to improve my writing score. Uh, give me some uh, feedback on my writing. And in this case, I really wanted to focus on vocabulary and word choice. We know that on the TOEFL, so much of the differences in scores, especially at the higher levels, have to do with some changes in grammar, often vocabulary, word choice, et cetera. So I really want to work on that. Um, so I have this little sample that I wrote. I plugged it in. And uh, what did uh, ChatGPT give me? Well, did it, first of all, it encouraged me. Great job. That's nice to hear. Um, remember, this is just a machine, an algorithm, but nevertheless. And it gave me a revised version uh, with improved vocabulary and word choice. And then look at that. It gave me examples of what it did and why it did it. Uh, replacing challenging with poses, various challenges, et cetera. Um, now, uh, is this always going to work? Is it always going to work well? No. But these kinds of tools, if you go back to thinking about what is the objective to be a better learner, to be a better writer, to have more individualized instruction, all of that, and to reduce the workload on teachers, make their job more efficient, you can start to see how these kinds of tools and these examples I'm sharing here um, can represent a pretty powerful step forward. So with all of that, I want to give you some general guidelines. Uh, maybe this has been inspiring on some level. Maybe you've already been experimenting and you want to jump in more. Maybe you've been a little worried or you just don't understand it. But wherever you are, I hope I, I've encouraged you to maybe think about how to move forward a little bit. Just some general guidance. Number one, don't be afraid. You can't break any of these tools. Start playing around with them. Download the free version. Figure out what's out there. Can you, can you explore all of them? No. Can you try one a week or one now and then? Sure. Uh, in my case, I've really been going deep over the last few months into chat GPT, um, but there are tons of others that I'm thinking about, and I might start taking a, 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 a try at some of those. Um, how about a trial and error learning approach? See what works, what doesn't. Many of the people writing about these things out there aren't really in the classroom, so you have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. And I think you need to get out there and try it and see what works and what doesn't. Um, and that's where you really start to see up close and personal, whoa, that's amazing, or whoa, that doesn't work at all. Um, look, like on that slide earlier, start with the tasks and the needs that you want to accomplish. I would worry less about starting at looking at the tools and kind of what's cool or neat. Uh, so really start to focus on what do I want to do and then, and then work from there. Um, uh, one thing I'm learning is that with, with a tool like ChatGPT or other interactive bot-based kind of, I have to talk to the, the, to the uh, tool to get it to work, it, it's a skill. Learning to talk to it and give it prompts is something that you have to learn to do in order to use the tool well um, and get the kind of content you need. So I would say focus on that, learn to do that. Um, there's actually an article in the Atlantic I linked to there. Uh, that says this is probably going to be one of the most important jobs of the century is, is sort of how we interact and get the tools to do what we want them to do. And there's a there's a human element in our part on that. Uh, and then be curious, but also critical, as I said before. Um, I'm doing some research with some of my colleagues and students in this area, some things I'm learning. Technology can enhance learning. We know that. Um, we know that it's becoming more prevalent. We have to, as teachers and students, learn to work with it more. Um, one of the coolest things for me is this last bullet, that all of this really, I think, is pushing us collectively to think more about student learning. Not just 
teaching performance, but what are my students actually learning? What is, what is the data to show that? What is the evidence? How do I know that? And that's probably one of the most exciting things about this whole movement. Uh, just some things that studies that we're thinking about doing this fall. Uh, one would be to look work with our teachers to think about how they experience using some tools. Uh, we've been thinking about the writing piece, perhaps maybe doing a pre post survey because um, we really want to engage our students and we want to see about how this is working and be part of the, the part of the contribution to the larger movement. So we would you know, conduct these studies and write some things up and publish them uh, so others can benefit from them. Uh, we thought about doing something with us as faculty, uh, kind of a reflective study where we keep a, we use some tools, maybe all of our faculty uh, focus on different tools. We sort of use that over a semester, keep a reflective journal. How is it working? How is it not? We write up some results and I think that would make a really nice piece um, as well. And then uh, we're thinking about too, like what can we do specifically to make our courses even better? Find more creative activities, create new content to make to make them even more engaging and interesting. So these are just some things that we're doing to continue to learn ourselves. Um, on this slide here, I've given you some resources for further reading. Uh, the Larry Ferlazzo site is one of those on here. I'd encourage you to go there. This guy has hundreds of resources he writes about, keeps up on them, talks about them, and links you to them. So that's a good site to check out. I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Philbeck. It's very useful information and for our audience, they find out uh, many like AI tools and some examples that can help them to understand more about AI and education. And we have uh, some questions from Zoom. Maybe we can look at the Zoom questions first. And the first one uh, is, thanks, Professor. I'm just wonder how can educators effectively prepare individuals for the upcoming era? Uh, great question, Tony. Um, so first of all, I would say that <clears throat> this is a question that's being asked by a lot of people, um, even by myself and my colleagues. So we are at a point right now, I would call it a tipping point, where we now realize it's not an option. I would say even five or 10 years ago, you could say, oh, that person is really good at incorporating technology into their teaching, or that person is you know, really good at uh, technology enhanced learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm not, or they are, but we are not. And generally speaking, you had a little bit more uh, of the people who were sort of the lower on the adopter um, scale. Uh, that, I think, I would say that's really over. And, um, and, and now we're moving into a place where um, we are going to have to be not only in education and teaching and learning, but all areas of our life more conversant with these kinds of technologies. So um, I would say that the, our approach that we're taking now to answer your question is to uh, move quickly and move rapidly and uh, admit that we are learners, even as faculty. Uh, across the faculty that I work with, for example, we have some those that are really advanced and some that are admittedly a little bit um, uh, slower uh, on this continuum, but that we're all on board and we're all now in agreement that this is something that we have to do to support our students um, and to help prepare them. So I think it's going to be, you're going to see different programs and different groups and different, you know, um, sectors moving at different paces. Uh, but I think we have to jump out with our students, work with them, um, start to do the kinds of studies. Uh, 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 just quick example uh, to further answer your question. Um, we're actually thinking about how do we create guidelines for using this technology in our program? Well, I was just on the phone with this week with one of my colleagues who said, you know what, I think this has to be collaborative. So we're actually already now thinking about how this fall we can make creating guidelines for AI use in our program a collaborative experience between us and our students. Um, and so that's how I would answer your question, but that's a great question, uh, Tony. Thank you, Dr. Philbeck. And another question is more about the TESO program. 
And Ben asks, uh, dear professor, will your class include instruction on how to effectively incorporate AI in student studies from now on? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we, are, we are moving very briskly uh, toward that end. And we will actually start, we've already, we've already started some experimentation this last year, um, but a lot of our posture this last year was sort of preparation. So we're we're going to be moving very quickly. Um, even the studies that I showed you a moment ago are our attempt, because all of our faculty engage in research. But one of the things that we're doing now is we're saying, let's shift our focus in our research a little bit more to this area. So this then will become something we are better at. And then th th that will have a spillover effect um, in our in our courses and, and among our students. So um, a, a strong yes to uh, Cynthia's question or to uh, the other question. Yes, uh, yes. Here is then another question is about how does um, AI facilitate cross-cultural exchange and language learning opportunities in TESO classrooms? Okay, I, I love this question. Um, one of the areas that I'm interested in is in, in uh, cross-cultural exchange. I used to do training in that area. There is something called COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, really interesting movement that you might wanna explore. Um, one quick example, uh, Rosetta Stone, get famous you know, uh, learning tool out there. They actually have a AI assisted matching tool that will ensure that it matches students uh, who want to engage in, in a, a dialogue, um, it will make sure that it matches students in different areas of the world, but at appropriate levels based on certain interests. That's a small but not ins insignificant example of how AI is being used to ensure that there's a, an interesting kind of cultural dimension to those kinds of exchanges. So that's Rosetta Stone. That's one small example, but I think that is just one example of how that might take place. Um, I, there's, I, I'm already thinking of other examples, but uh, I want to move on. But that's a great uh, question, Cynthia. Thank you. And the next one is, uh, we are facing lots of disparities in students' levels in our teaching activities. How do you think AI could help in, in terms of better employing different strategies in teaching different levels of students? Thanks. So when we talk about differentiation, we're thinking about process, pro, process, content, process, or product, or process, content, or product. So we can we can diff, we can change the type of content that we give different level of students, or we can give them a different process, or we can give them a different product. AI generative AI can help with any of those, um, and that's one of the actually areas that I think it really shines. So that example I gave earlier, again, took me like five minutes. But I, I had reading content that I wanted to give my students the next day, right? And I knew that I had students at a different level. And, and rather than me spend an hour on the internet trying to find different leveled stories or have to have to have them pay for some leveled text or whatever my school district didn't offer, I don't know. I simply spent, uh, in that case, again, a matter of minutes to generate three leveled texts based on the same content very quickly using an AI, a generative AI tool. So again, small example, but you can also see how that could spin off lots of different examples. What if I wanted to change the activity a little bit? I could have an AI tool help me do that. What if I wanted to change the product that they generated differently because I, I knew that I wanted to tailor it more to different levels? I could do that. So this is huge because differentiation, dealing with mixed level classrooms is a problem all over the world for teachers. We talk a lot about differentiating and tailoring our instruction different, to different levels, but it's rarely done, frankly. It's, it's too much work. It takes too much time. So to me, this is actually one of the areas that I think AI could step in and help teachers everywhere make those kinds of uh, distinctions. These are Thank great you. questions. And the uh, questions from Tiffany uh, ask about, um, uh, yeah, thank you for the informative session and sharing your experience with using AI tools, Dr. Feedback. And how do you think second language assessment, summative and formative may change in your classroom? 
I don't know yet. We're starting to think about that. And assessment is a huge area. Um, I, I think just quick answers in response to this good question. You know, number one, I think we're probably going to be figuring that's one area that we're going to be working with our students together with them to think about how can we use generative AI to create assessments? How can we use generative AI to, to creatively and effectively assess student work? So those that's going to be an area that's going to be really rich for exploration. Um, in terms of my assessments in my course or the assessments in the courses of my colleagues, I, I would go back to what I was saying earlier, where we are going to be probably changing some of them, maybe 30%, because what we've learned is that our assessments, maybe some of them are vulnerable, where we wouldn't want someone to be using a generative AI to simply come up with a response, a generic response to, to, to answer some prompt. So we will be changing those assessments to make them even more unique, distinctive, geared to the learning outcomes and something that it would require a student to do real higher order thinking about in order to respond to. So uh, I would say on two levels, we're going to be exploring what it means to, to really think about assessments in the field, broadly speaking. And on a practical level, our assessments and our courses, some of them are going to change uh, in order to be, uh, I think, even stronger um, as a result of some of the movement that we've seen around uh, generative AI. Thank you. And the next question from Zoom is, dear professor, do you think teachers should start using AI at the very beginning of their career or after they have gained enough experience in teaching skills such as activity design example as shown in this slide? Uh, uh, Maxine, I think you should probably start right away because it's. I don't think it's going to be and I would say it's even already not an add-on skill, an optional skill. I think that I, I sit on uh, teacher interviews. I, I, I help districts sit on hiring committees for teachers, and I know the kinds of things we ask. My guess is if I was sitting on a committee in the next few months, the questions about AI would probably come up in teaching interviews. We would probably be asking at least a question about how are you at using what we just want to we'd probably want to at least know what you thought about it and then we would probably want to know how you're going to use it and incorporate it again some of that might be driven by you know are you going to make sure your students don't cheat right that kind of mentality of some on the committee but i think we would also be having a question of this is the new reality how is how are you as a teacher going to navigate this so um yeah i would say definitely the sooner we can all start to dive in and at least understand it Maybe we don't have to become experts, but we have to start exploring it, the better. Thank you. And also from the live streaming platform, and there is already a discussion about the AI uh, can be our friend or our enemy. And some of them <laughs> has already enjoyed that uh, it can save up time and become efficient to use AI in like grading and lesson plan and do their work like in writing. And some of them think that uh, they bring out a lot of uh, questions about uh, to, uh, it's a barrier for, for us. So an uh, audience uh, asks about, one audience asks about, um, it is a trend with the growth of AI to use, um, but uh, what do you think about uh, the teachers will become less creative if they use more technology or AI uh, in their lesson, in their class? So I am thinking that, let me just go back to those examples I gave earlier about enlisting ChatGPT to help me create content for my classroom the next day. I, in, in my experience of, of even doing those in preparation for this talk tonight or other things that I've been doing over the last um, few months with ChatGPT in particular, and I actually teach on, on the area of creativity, all right? So I think a lot about what it means to be creative and how to create novel and useful things. I don't see it as making me less creative at all. I see it as challenging me in new ways, but also it's essentially a tool, an assistant in my creative process. So I'm able to generate 
if we want to call it, be, be more creative in terms of increasing my pace and productivity and creative in generating creative things. The other thing that I'll say is, and this gets back to my be curious, but also critical. Again, a lot of the stuff that AI is generating is junk. It's garbage. You don't want it. So you have to be the, the expert. You still have to be the judge. You still have to be the evaluator. You still have to be ultimately the creative person that's putting it all together. Um, and those lessons that I gave as an example of what it generated, I would have to critique those. I'd have to read them carefully. And I'd probably find lots of things in there that I'm like, well, that's dumb. I'm going to do it this way. I got to bring this over here. So we are still the architects. We're still in control. And uh, these tools are not going to replace us. They are potentially good assistants um, and helpful brainstormers, if you will. Um, but we have to be the one that is still ultimately the creative designer and the content creator for our students. Um, if anybody goes away from here hearing me, you think I'm saying, let ChatGPT create all the content for your students. That's not what I'm saying. That would be that, that would be ludicrous. That would be very naive um, and I would and harmful even. Uh, instead, we have to think about how we can be in control and harness these tools to help us be better teachers. The, the more time that I can spend on thinking about my students, thinking about the learning outcomes, and thinking about how this is gonna meet their needs, whatever it is, that's a win. Um, I'm spending less time searching the internet for the story or trying to figure out how to level this reading content that I have into three different levels. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, another questions from the audience asks about the equity of education. And he asks about uh, the rural area, uh, the teachers uh, will be there uh, any solution or still a problem about if they don't have technology uh, yeah, as a city? Yeah, this is a big one. This is one I think about a lot. Um, you know, I think a lot <clears throat> about countries that I've been to. Uh, I've been to Sub-Saharan Africa. I, I've worked uh, with the Maasai, one of the major uh, nomadic groups in Africa, Africa in, in Tanzania. I've been out to the bush. I've spent two weeks almost total uh, in different visits, working with teachers and with school leaders at community-based schools where it's not just that lack of technology, there's no electricity. So if you're going to use technology, it means, uh, you know, uh, a long walk or a truck ride into Arusha, the capital. So I don't have an easy answer for that. I really don't. Um, and in my experience working with those teachers in particular, uh, we were not talking about technology in the sense of things that required power, for example, to run. We were talking about things like um, how they could get the students out of the school, build maps with rocks on the ground to make learning more active. That was technology in that sense, right? So um, you, this is a really important question, a really good question. And I'm sorry that I, I don't have a really solid answer for, for dealing with um, situations where there's a real tangible practical lack in terms of some of the basic resources that we would needed to access some of these tools. I do know that we are seeing movement in this area. There's potential solutions for bringing in more access, but it's not scalable yet. It's more like one-off solutions here and there. Um, so uh, at this point, I, I just have to say, this is a really important question that we need to think about more carefully. And um, um, again, there's some cool innovations, some cool experiments. Look at the, uh, uh, the Cotter, Cotter Foundation uh, has the WISE Awards. And if you go to the Cotter Foundation and look at their WISE Awards, they have several each year. So many of the examples uh, of the uh, solutions that they give awards to are doing really cool things in this specific area, like getting into rural areas and, and providing some interesting solutions. But, but again, it's, it's not scalable. It's more like in you know, specific situations in a given context. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fieldback. And next questions from the audience uh, asks about uh, the chat GBT example you just uh, shows us is about to generate language content in class activity. 
So what do you think about students and teachers use ChatGPT to improve their content uh, to, and get more examples in their uh, assignment, essay? Uh, yeah, some, some, yes. some. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's what that's the beauty of it, right? Like, um, again, the the real critics and back to some of the discussion you were talking about, is it friend or foe? Is it our friend or our enemy? Well, these things can be our enemy. We have to go in with a critical mindset. We have to be aware that they're going to be used for all sorts of purposes. So we can't deny that. But if we if we get jump in and we start navigating it and we start experimenting then we can start to see where we can leverage it in important ways. So absolutely. I mean, some of the best things we need for learning are good examples and multiple examples. We need lots of examples to reinforce concepts, right? And so uh, uh, if, if I, as a teacher, am having trouble finding examples, then what an amazing tool to be able to say in a few seconds, give me an example of this concept and tell me a little story using this concept and blah, 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 blah. Boom, you've got, and, and by the way, do that in five different contexts. Boom, I've got these different little stories. Now, maybe they're imperfect. Maybe we have to tweak them, but you could be generating uh, uh, lots of examples and lots of content. And then I love the question because then you could have your students learn how to do that for themselves. So I think I, I have a, a strong yes to that question. I think there's a lot of potential for that line of thinking. Thank you. And the next question is about the USC resources. And the audience says from the news, uh, I find out that the USC Center for Generative AI and Society. Uh, so if you can introduce a bit more about this center uh, that Russia School uh, has joined in this center and do students have opportunity to use the uh, resources or do research from there? Yeah, so uh, I love that you are asking about this center. So Stephen Aguilar, one of our faculty members at Rossier, um, a few others. I myself have expressed, you know, strong interest. I'd love to keep up with what they're doing, but I'm not formally a part of the team right now. Um, but Stephen Aguilar with Rossier, and then a, colleagues over at what we call the Institute for Creative Technology, um, and others in the School of Engineering are all collaborating. Now, um, the reality is it takes a couple of years to get a center up and running. This was just announced this last year. So at this point, I don't even think they have a purpose statement and, and an agenda and, and money coming in yet. Um, but I would say probably in the next, I'm guessing six or nine months, they'll be getting their first grant and starting to get going. Um, so I can't speak too much about it. I know some of the people that are involved. It's exciting. I think it's important. It's timely based, again, building on some of the things I've said tonight. I think, you know, we got to do it. We got to have centers like that that are, and I think you're going to be a lot more popping up. So could you, if you were coming here, be involved? I don't know what being involved in that would look like yet. Could you learn more about it? Could you say, hey, I'm a student in X program and I'd love to be involved? Sure. And they'd probably welcome that uh, as someone who could, um, you know, help them think through what it means to start a project or what kind of a role students could have in that, the shaping of a center. So great question. It's too soon to, to say exactly what that center is going to be doing. Um, but I know there's a lot of excitement about it. So I'm sure it'll be a, a great resource. Thank you. And the last questions uh, we would like to pick from the live streaming. Uh, I think it's a little bit similar from the Zoom, the last question. So uh, maybe Dr. Feelback, you can answer them together. Okay. Uh, the live stream audience uh, asks about how can educators and institutions effectively prepare uh, teachers uh, in training or integrate uh, AI tools into TESO instruction? Yeah, so I th I think that, um, again, kind of going back to some of the themes I've talked about tonight, I would say we, we can't wait. Um, we And we can't even wait for specific courses to be developed or for a particular certificate to be awarded that we could then take and say, I can do X, Y, or Z. I think we're at a point now where things are moving very quickly. 
And we have to start with more of the um, uh, what we call um, uh, fail fast. There, there's different ways of talking about this in, in terms of creativity, but but it's much more of a um, experiment based approach of, to learning. It's like, I'm going to try something, I'm going to learn from it, um, and I'm going to move on. And I think that that's the kind of mentality that we have to have. And so whether you are an educator, whether you're a teacher educator or a teacher, um, or you're a student, I think we have to play a role in this by asking questions, trying things out, talking about it openly and transparently, because some of these things are, um, you know, some of these things are kind of difficult to talk about. Like I was, I was doing a, I'm co-writing a chapter with a, a colleague uh, and we've been working on it this, this last month. And um, I was using chat GPT to kind of help me think about how to organize the chapter in terms of big topics. Well, then I got on the phone with my colleague, Chad, and I was like, well, Chad, I, I was sort of using chat GPT to help outline our chapter. What do you think of that? And he was like, Oh, I did that too. And, I'm, and then we laughed, right? But I mean, it's like we're in this new world where we we have to start thinking about how do we talk about these assistants that were this assistance that we might be using and how do we talk about it openly? So I think that we just have to start experimenting, start having conversations about it um, and start, I mean, just at the basic level, it starts it starts with acknowledging that this is a reality that we are all moving into together. And, and if we can start to have conversations, whether it's formally in a program, in our department, wherever we're teaching, in some other venue, in a learning community, whatever, I, I really am I'm very convinced now that, you know, we have to have these kind of conversations and the kind of conversations that we're having tonight too, and, and really start thinking about this together um, and not let AI, not be afraid or let things take over or drive us, but make sure we are continuing to be the experts and the um, guides, you know, through this for us and for our students. Thank you. And that is our Q&A session. Thank you, everyone. And closing to the end, and now we have uh, up to 4,000 viewers uh, on our WeChat channel and TikTok channel. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's event. And so um, also to Dr. Feelback and to our audience in Zoom, as well as live streaming, um, and may maybe you can have some words uh, or advice uh, to give them, uh, maybe some of them as the students and some of them thinking about get a career as language teacher in the future. Uh, maybe you can uh, give some words to them in the end. Great. Well, look, I first of all, it's a pleasure being with you. And, and, and again, greetings to all of you. Thank you for participating, whether you're in the room or to those among you that are live streaming. It's, it's a, a real pleasure to be uh, interacting with you like this. Um, I would go back to uh, the beginning for me, why I became a teacher. Um, I was hoping to become a medical doctor. I'd gone to college and studied chemistry, and I was planning to go to medical school. For me, teaching was a what we call a gap year after college. I went uh, to another country. I became a language teacher. And I said, I'm going to do this for a year. And then I'm going to go back and take the MCAT and go on to med school. And after that year, uh, I really was changed. And I realized how powerful education was to help people. Because ultimately, I think I wanted to be a doctor to help people, even though it was a good career. But I, I saw firsthand how powerful education could be. So then I stayed. I taught another year and then another and then ended up teaching in a few different settings at the high school level and at the college level. And then uh, going back and working as a, a researcher at a university in the field of education, I'm now more convinced than ever that education, making sure people get good education at all levels, particularly women and children, particularly in, in, in challenging parts of the world, is such a powerful mechanism for uplift in society for improving a person's life or a group of people's lives. So I would just say, wherever you are, whatever you're thinking, remember that because teaching's hard work. <laughs> it's often a thankless job. And often there's lots of things working against us. And if we just go back to our mission 
And why we're doing this in the first place, I think that can bring a lot of um, uh, reward and help us make sense of a lot of the things that we have to deal with. So um, that would be my encouragement. And, um, you know, again, whether you're in the language teaching field or you're thinking about getting into it, um, I, I wish you the best. And of course, I'm happy to help advise or communicate with anybody should you wish.